Last week we finished up the Smyrna Church and this week we're going to start the Pergamum Church. I want to give a little background um, about the city of Pergamum. First of all, it was the capital of Asia, so it was one of the bigger cities in, out of the seven churches. It's actually, it was very famous for its library. It had close to 200,000 handwritten manuscripts, um, which the only the only library that was bigger than the one at Pergamum was the one in Alexandria. It was also a very spiritual city and there were a lot of centers for worship there for some of the more prominent familiar Roman gods that we're used to hearing about like Athena and Zeus. Let's read in Revelation chapter 2 what Jesus wrote to them. He said, And to the messenger of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And that's, that's an interesting reference because, you know, we don't really believe that the throne of Satan was actually in Pergamum, but I think what he's referencing there is that the, the demonic influence that the city of Pergamum had over the rest of Asia, because as I said, it was the capital city. And so it really controlled a lot of what happened in these other seven cities and really in the whole Roman Empire. So the fact that Jesus says that Satan's throne is in Pergamum, it really shows the influence that this city had and that how it was obviously kind of a stronghold that Satan uh, was resisting this church. You know, because he, if this is his throne and this is where he's able to control what's going on in the other areas, he's doing everything he can to resist the birth of this church and the planting of this church because he knows that if, if it gets off the ground and they start to share the gospel and spread the gospel, then he's going to begin to lose his influence. So he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So he mentions, of course, again, that this is where Satan dwells. This is like his throne. And then he mentions this person, Antipas. And we don't really have a lot of information about uh, Antipas. There is, um, there's some tradition that he was the bishop, actually, at Pergamum, and that he was martyred. And the tradition goes that he was put in this gigantic brass bull, and then uh, fire was built under it and he was basically roasted alive in this gigantic brass bull. But there's no other secondary sources to confirm that, so it's kind of speculative. People don't really know whether that happened or not. But obviously he died for his faith. Obviously he, he died being a witness for Christ and he stood his ground. And, um, and so that's what he says. He says, you hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas. So whatever happened to Antipas, what he's saying is, you know, it, it could have caused you to crumble. It could have caused you to kind of bow your knee when you saw what happened to him. The same thing could have happened to you, but you held strong and you held your faith and, and you did not deny my name. And you stayed faithful to Christ. And the term that is used here for witness, as it is everywhere in Scripture, is a legal term. You know, it's almost as somebody who would be called to a court of law to give their, their testimony and be that witness. So what he's saying is, even in the face of severe persecution unto death, you stayed faithful to proclaim that witness and that testimony, or you didn't alter it to preserve your life. And I think for us today, we've kind of talked about this some last week, but I think for us today, that's, that's an encouragement that you know, we, we, Jesus sees it when we stand strong in the face of persecution and we proclaim our testimony and our witness boldly and we do not change it, we do not alter it. That's basically the list of good things that he has to say. It's pretty much just the one thing that, you know, they didn't deny the faith, they stayed strong under, under persecution. And then in verse 14 he gets to the negative things. He says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans, therefore repent. Now, there's two main focuses that I want us to really look at this week, uh, or over the next two weeks. And the first one that we're gonna get in tonight 
is where he, he, he goes through this and he says, I have a few things against you. And, and mainly what it is, is this heresy, this false teaching has been allowed to infiltrate the church. And so he's, that's what he's frustrated about. And that's what he's angry about. He says, therefore, you need to repent. And repent for what? Well, I would say, first of all, repent if you've ascribed to this teaching and you've connected yourself to this teaching. If you followed it in any way, you need to repent for that because it's not the gospel. It's not the truth. Turn from it and repent. But I think the other thing that he's addressing here is the need for repentance for the leaders who did not address this and cut it out and deal with it or confront it as they needed to. So he's telling them, you need to repent for not dealing with this heresy and confronting it and doing, doing what was best for the body of Christ and what was best for the sheep. I think this is a difficult topic for a lot of people in the body of Christ to see clearly on. Because you have this one group on one side of the ditch that is saying that that's very rigid, very harsh, almost like the Pharisees. You know, uh, if you if you speak a word of heresy, we will stone you to death. You know, in modern day we wouldn't do that, but we you know kick them out of the church, get rid of them. You know, just like this very aggressive approach. And then you have this other side who's all love, all mercy. You know, everyone's views are equal and and tolerable, and we just need to love one another type thing. So I don't think either is right, and I think the way that we should handle it is the way that we see in, in Scripture. You know, Jesus was very serious about this. Paul was very serious. Typically, they would give people space to repent. They would make the confrontation, hey, you, you know, make this adjustment, get this right. Um, you know, Jesus even gives clear instruction in the New Testament about how to confront someone who is in, in sin or in error. He says, look, bring a brother with you, you know, confront them if they won't do it, you know, get some more of the church involved. So there has to be that moment of confrontation. And some people are very uncomfortable with this, very uncomfortable, whether it be dealing with a person who's in sin in the church or dealing with wrong teaching, wrong, you know, uh, heresy, error, people, they just, they don't like any kind of confrontation whatsoever. And, and I'll even extend this to um, what the Bible calls wolves. You know, the Bible talks a lot about wolves coming into the, the midst of the flock of God, trying to work their way into the flock of God. What is a wolf? A wolf is someone who has a wrong heart and a wrong motive, and they're being used by the enemy to, to, to damage and hurt the flock of God. Now, they may not know they're a wolf, or they may know that they're a wolf. That's really irrelevant. They're coming in to cause damage and hurt in the body of Christ. And it is the pastor and the leadership's job to deal with those, those type of people. But I think it's important for our body and the, the church overall to know that any healthy church is going to have people come in from time to time that their heart and their motives are not right. Whereas 99% of the people, maybe that's a high percentage, uh, come in and they're there because they want to worship God, they want to serve, and they have the right. There's going to be a small percentage of people that come in, and it will not be readily obvious to everyone who's around. That's why the Bible says that you hear that term, a wolf in sheep's clothing. The point is that it's deceptive. You know, it's not always easily recognizable. But here we have a church who's being rebuked by Jesus for not being aggressive enough, for not being confrontational enough with some, something or someone who has slipped into the flock. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul is talking to the elders of the Ephesian church. He says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. So this is a very serious statement. He's talking to the leaders of the Ephesian church. The, the uh, you know, undoubtedly the pastor and the bishop are there and whatever leadership was involved. He's talking to them and he says, listen, pay very careful attention, first of all, to yourselves. Make sure that you are, that you are not used as an instrument to hurt the body of Christ. And number two, pay very close attention to the flock. What is happening in the flock? Who has influence in the flock? Who has leadership in the in the flock pay very close attention to the flock which the holy spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of god which he obtained with his own blood he's letting them know 
you are you have been made a steward over something that the blood of Jesus Christ was the price that had to be paid to obtain it. And you've been made an overseer over that to steward it and watch over it. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert. Remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. So why does he say be alert? He says all this about the wolves coming in. Then he says, therefore be alert. Why? Because you're supposed to be looking for the wolves. You're supposed to be looking for this type of person that would come in and damage the flock. You know, another important point to bring up here about wolves is that we are definitely not talking about sinners that come into the church that have problems in their life and may have sin, major sin or wrong motive. That's, that is not what Paul is talking about, Jesus, any of these scriptures that we've read. That is not what they're talking about. They are talking about, typically these are people who profess to be Christians, you know, and that somehow their, their motives or their heart, you know, they have yielded to Satan in some way and he's now using them as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Not wanting to look at sinners come in and judge them thinking, oh, well, they have this sin in their life and they're trying to get other people to sin, so they must be a wolf. No, that's very unlikely. It's more likely going to be someone that is, that people would actually look to and respect as some sort of Christian leader or influential Christian person that then begins to draw people to themselves out of wrong motives and, and uh, wrong desires. Now. And in, in my time at One Life, we've been going just for over five years. We, we've had this, we've experienced this. We've had people come in the church that their heart was not right. You know, what, whatever was in them was not right. And almost, usually, almost immediately, God begins to let me know that something's not right about this person. I don't just jump to, hey, you know, you don't belong here, get out of here, anything like that. It's just that kind of red flag of be cautious, be, be perceptive, just as he said here, be alert. And we've had to deal with several things throughout the years, but hopefully they've been dealt with in a way that it didn't even really cause a ripple, that most people didn't even know anything that was going on, that it was dealt with, and, and I think that's how it's supposed to be handled. But what's happening here in Pergamum that Jesus is having to correct is, he said, when you, a wolf came in and instead of them being kept in their proper place and kept at bay and being alert and watching them, instead you gave them a p position of influence and a position of power and they begin to spread their disease throughout the whole body. And now they're teaching false doctrine, people are being influenced and it's beginning to hurt and damage the church. And as the leaders, you're not doing anything about it. And that's why he's saying you have to repent and deal with this situation. Is it going to be pretty? No. At this point, no. To go, to go in and try to deal with what, what is happening here in the church of Pergamum, it's probably going to cause an enormous stink. But Jesus, the head of the church, the one who paid the price for it with his own blood, is saying this has to be dealt with. Listen to this. Love this scripture. This is John 10, 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is saying this. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And so we're not the great shepherd. Pastors, leaders are not the shepherd but we are under shepherds, under Christ, and we are fulfilling His role of shepherd in these churches. So what He's saying is if you're just a hireling, you're just a hired hand, when the wolf comes, you don't want to deal with it. You don't want to avoid You'd rather just flee with everybody else. But He says a true shepherd and a true pastor will come in and deal with these situations. Now you might be sitting here thinking, okay, what does this have to do with, with any of us? You know, yeah, fine. Wolves come in, pastors, leader, y'all just deal with it. Don't even, you know, don't involve us. Don't let us know, you know. And well, I think that that's the wrong way to look at it. I think, number one, it's important for everybody in our church to know 
that there are going to be things happen in your church that from an outsider's perspective that may not have all the information, it may look like, man, why, why was that handled that way? Or why did this happen to that person or whatever? And you have to understand that there may be more information that you know that you don't know about and that sometimes this process is going on behind the scenes that you're not even aware of it. So that's that's number one. But number two, um, it's not only the pastors and the leader job to keep you away from being influenced by the wolf. So what happens if there's a wolf in our midst that that hasn't been identified yet and you're the one that that he, that he or she is starting to prey upon, then you need to be spiritually mature enough to know, wait a minute, everybody who comes to church is not just somebody I need to trust hook, line, and sinker. You know, maybe maybe even certain people in leadership, I'm not trying to create like some paranoia that where you're just afraid of your leaders and afraid of people in the church. Of course not. This is, this is a rare thing. But I'm saying spiritually, we need to be mature enough to recognize and, and be led by the Spirit enough to recognize Mm, something's not right about this person. And the Holy Spirit will show you that and, and check you on that so that you can be perceptive enough to not be deceived by you know, how the enemy would try to work in your, in your life and in your church. Mm -hmm.